So we are going back to the discussion uh, that we started about Mary Meeker stuff. Okay, and this is actually the summary of the way she presents things. COVID-19 equates to a shock and then the aftershocks. The shock is two months, three months, social distancing, lock at home and extent. Aftershocks, we have no idea what's going to be happening, um, but of course we are trying to predict and deal with it. Second, basically talk about viruses and microbes and said that they always have been, and this is just a new version. Third one, talking about the things that Mary Meeker always talks about innovation and uh, technology. Then, um, rapid changes drive growth in both directions. Experts, and you've seen this with President Trump's talks every day, is uh, experts are taking over a more important role in policy making, hopefully. Okay, now I am going to ask you at the end of this, or at when I feel that I don't have too much time left, to tell me what you think that's going to change in your lives so or in the lives of everyone, if anything, um, uh, when now that things are reopening and let's say in a year what's going to be happening. Uh, the other thing they claim is going to be happening is digital transformation, acceleration. And one thing they talk extensively is on-demand services. And that's kind of a mixed thing because some on-demand services at this moment, like Uber and uh, Airbnb, are not doing very well. Um, and then a little bit of discussion of the role of the government and some very unusual route that the government is taking. Um, and then discussing what is happening or what's going to happen with healthcare. And uh, they also talk about sports. I excluded the slides because I didn't have it, enough time. So that's where we are going to go. Okay. Um, this is actually uh, trying to talk about the measures that are being taken. If you look at this slide, um, this is not the first stimulus bill. Actually, in 1933-40, uh, uh, Roosevelt did the New Deal, which he invested money on infrastructure and in many other things for the country. Uh, and there was quite a lot of money for that time. And then uh, when we had the 208 crisis, we, have, we had basically a major ingestion of money for the banks, uh, what they call TARP. And now we have uh, the CARES Act. But actually, that's just the beginning. Probably, they, they already the country, through the Fed and through the Congress, already uh, have basically apportioned $4 billion into sustaining the banks and sustaining smaller businesses and uh, helping people that were unemployed. The number of unemployed uh, is really, really very high, although in the last announcement, there have been a re-employment of 2 million people. But still the numbers, the percentages of unemployed are as big as the Big Depression um, or larger. And then the, the picture on the right is actually bringing all the dollars into current dollars, basically show, and, and this is only showing 2 trillion in the CARE Act, and actually the CARE Act and other um, initiatives is going to be much more, and Congress is talking about even another injection. 
So this is actually in adjusted dollars, the largest injection that ever uh, happened in the United States by the country. And basically this kind of new economics, new economics whereby the government can pour money into the economy um, and not create major disbalance on money. Meaning in the days of the dollar bills, uh, printing money would create major inflation. And we didn't have a major inflation uh, with TARP. So it's kind of interesting. It's, uh, I don't think that economic theories, there are many that j explain this very well. And I actually have a question for you or for me. Um, what's going to happen with $4 trillion or $6 trillion uh, in just, just for you to understand or think about the dimension of this. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is all from, uh, from uh, Mary Mika. Uh, this is actually the level of public debt of the United States. And so the largest one is Japan, where which public debt is 236% of GDP. Uh, and that sounds really very, very large, but you have to understand something about Japan. Most of the debt is held by, the, by own Japan. It's basically uh, the institutions of saving are internal, they are very uh, government oriented, and so they haven't gone outside and borrowed money from other countries very much. It's all internal. And so if the, the interest rate is controlled in Japan, the cost for the government is reasonably managed. Now, the other ones are much more concerning. And you look at Sudan, I have no idea about Sudan, but Greece, you, you have followed all the difficulties that Greece had. Uh, and look at the US. The US uh, in 2018 war had basically the amount of his GDP in debt. And a lot of the debt is being held by China and by other international organizations. And some countries that we think that are basket cases in economics, like Argentina, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera, have much lower debts. Okay, now let me read you this thing below this. For context, the 4.3 trillion in government monetary so what they were first showing is two trillion. Now they are talking about 4.3 trillion in government monetary fiscal responses is equivalent of 124% of the US government revenue. Why is that? Is because the government revenue is only a small percentage of GDP. And it's 20% of GDP. So it uh, simplistically would take a total debt. GDP level of 127% versus 107% now. And you know, you have seen that a lot of people were complaining that there is too much debt by the government of the US. And so they are taking more, something like 20%, which is, you have to think about, we don't know what the consequence is going to be. Uh, as they say here, a redeeming factor here is the fact that the interest rate now is very low. And therefore, when the government borrows money, it will pay very little interest uh, in term in traditional terms. But you never know if the inflation starts accelerating, uh, the only thing that, uh, that the Fed can do is increase interest rates to control inflation. And that will increase the cost for the government tremendously. So this is, um, God knows what's going to happen here, but I, I don't think this is costless. This actually is here. And this is actually for, your, for you to see how the U.S. spends its money and how the U.S. government makes its money. So basically, if you look at fiscal year 2019, uh, individual income taxes are 50% of all the government revenue. Um, and it spends in a lot of stuff that are entitlement, like social security and et cetera. 
And actually what the government can control directly is only 20% of its budget, plus defense. And it spends about 8% of its money paying that. Now, if you're going to increase in 20% your debt or 30% your debt, you're going to finish up paying much more interest if the interest rate goes down. So it uh, goes up. And the other thing that happened here is that President Trump has increased uh, debt uh, or basically deficit. Why? Because last year or the year before, uh, basically he reduced substantially corporate taxes. And the estimate was that in five years, that was going to increase government debt in a trillion dollars, which in this whole ballpark is a small percentage, but a significant percentage. So even before the crisis, the government was indebting itself more than the normal. Meaning that many of the traditional economists think that if uh, that goes with inflation, it's okay. But uh, this is much more than inflation. Inflation actually has been very, very low in the United States. So I think we are going into this territory of unknown because of the large level of inputs in the country, the large level of increase of expenses by the government. I'm not doing being political, I'm just kind of talking, speculating about what's, uh, what is the effect. I don't think anyone really knows what is the effect of $4.3 trillion injection, and they are talking about one more. The other side of it is if the money is injected, particularly organizedly injected, increases substantially the expense level of the people. And that stimulates the economy, creates jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> the worst probably that could happen uh, if there was no injection is really a tremendous depression. With the injection of the government, maybe this will be controlled to a certain degree. And that's <coughs> federal, and this is the debt of the United States up to 2009. And if you notice, is the picture in the left. If you notice, the only percentage higher of federal debt of the United States was during the World War II in the 40s. And then progressively with inflation, that debt reduced as a percentage of uh, GDP. And now, uh, in the last maybe decade, the U.S. has been spending more than it earns substantially. You know, this is a whole uh, Keynesian economics that say that that's okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, the one in the right is actually the federal, uh, the interest, uh, the effective fund of funds rate, meaning what the government pays to borrow money. And as you notice, has gone down and people are talking about negative interest rate and et cetera. And in Japan, they have been for a while negative interest rates and Japan survived. And actually the economy of Japan got a little bit better. Although uh, the age bracket of the population, you know, longevity in Japan is very large. Uh, people live long years. And so obviously the government is doing something, something right. So what are the uh, key challenges now in post or during pandemic, according to Mary Mika? Understanding when people can safely leave their homes, resume some version of their former lives and restart the economy. All while balancing privacy and civil liberties. You heard me talking about privacy. The moment you start doing geolocational um, identification, face recognition, uh, and other forms of using, using data from people, you are basically invading privacy. The question is, there is a trade-off in the public good, 
maybe sometimes giving up a little bit of privacy uh, for the public good is okay. Uh, interesting, a series of attitude studies of people of your generation say that you guys are much less worried about privacy than my generation. Interesting consideration. And uh, I actually, I remember in my early days of discussing the internet, when uh, the World Wide Web came active, 93, 94, uh, the terminology use, we used to use is selling your eyeballs. And what does that mean? You get Google for free. So you give a lot of information from you to Google. Uh, you get Facebook for free. You give a lot of your personal information to Facebook in exchange of something you want to have. Um, the second key challenge is ensuring government funding efficiently gets the right hands. There have been a lot of discussion of organizations that are well financially, they haven't uh, got rid of too many employees and getting a lot of money from the government. Also, uh, people that are getting so much money from the government that they don't want to work. And this has been a classic discussion of social security, uh, disestimulating work, which is not a current discussion. Um, and then the third thing is really the shocking thing that uh, already the group discussed here is the number of small businesses that employ large percentage of uh, US population going out of business. And you know, that's what the words use, going out of business. Uh, we don't know. We don't know if they are going to really out of business or they are doing chapter 11 bankruptcy and coming back paying less of the debts, we really don't know. Uh, but I think there is no question there'll be a substantial number of businesses going out of business, and maybe some of them should, some of that shouldn't, meaning we don't really don't know exactly what the, what the effect is going to be. And uh, I think a lot of people are saying that there'll be a rebalancing of the economy, uh, breaking some of the modes, that were archaic, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Ensuring sufficient and creative ways for people to get back to work and or receive support that sustain long-term economic growth and management, managing government debt. So these are the key challenges, and let's talk a little bit about them. Okay, this is actually an interesting slide uh, it talks about uh, different pandemics, and it's, it's actually put things in prospect. First, if you look on the columns, you have the type of pandemic, you have how many people died, how many were infected, the mortality rate, how long it lasted, and when it happened and where it originated, um, and the region that was most affected. And if you can, you can see the number of deaths at this moment is not really very large compared, for example, with the bubonic plague that happened in the 1300s to the, to the, in the mid 1300s. And the other thing to, to be understood is that the world population was much, much, much smaller at that time, maybe one fourth of what is today. Um, smallpox, uh, Spanish flu, and the Spanish flu lasted like two and a half years, two years. Um, and basically, and then the question is, um, the, the question is how did it stop? the stopping mechanism. Bubonic plague uh, was basically people quarantining, and when enough people had antibodies, the survival immunity. Smallpox uh, vaccine was developed. Uh, Spanish flu, quarantine, and survival immunity. Uh, this very old thing, plague of Justinian, and this killed a lot of people, 30 to 50 million at that time was a large percentage of the population in the 500s. Uh, it was all survival immunity. And if you look at AIDS, um, uh, 
it's very tragic type of thing, but in comparison terms, uh, was not so affected. And the one thing is AIDS uh, actually don't have a vaccine. And so it has treatment, but it doesn't have a vaccine. Uh, however, it has been controlled. Um, so that this is kind of interesting to see. Uh, the, the one thing that puts in context is uh, viruses and microbes have been here forever. Now, we have an aggravating factor. Um, and the aggravating factor is modern technology and communications. And what that basically, uh, basically, if you look at the graph in the right, uh, is global passenger miles. And, uh, it, and, uh, and you can see that is a, a exponential growth of passenger travel. And the other thing, and they put the internet grow, uh, internet users versus growth here. Um, the blue in the left graph is the number of internet users. The red line is growth. And why has growth went down in internet users? Because most people have internet people that with economic ability have internet. So in countries like US, um, Canada, Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, actually there is saturation of internet usage. The growth is small, growth is proportional to population growth. Now in countries like Africa, South America, then the growth is still large uh, because there is interesting demand on it. But if you put growth of the internet together with growth of passenger miles, there is a story there. The story is you know more and more about other countries. You know more and more about their level of wealth. You know more and more about employment that it could happen. And so what really has happened is that there is substantial population migration immigration became a very sore political point in many countries. Uh, and uh, the traffic of passengers, not only immigration, but uh, meetings and tourism and et cetera, et cetera, creates an ideal channel for the transmission of viruses. And so basically there is most likely, unless very different rules happen, most likely this is going to continue to be uh, a worse problem of expansion of microbes and, and viruses ac across, the, across the world. Um, and what is the way to control uh, this thing? Three ways, as I said before. One, social distancing. This, and basically, avoid um, avoid people getting very close to each other and passing virus to each other. This, uh, that's one. The second one is developing something that cures it or at least reduces its damage. And the third one is a vaccine that prevents it from happening. Those are the three things that happen. And because the second and third have not happened yet, the only control that we have in the uh, in our world, in our pandemic now, is social distancing. And it's pretty clear that social distancing helps, if not works, in reducing the pandemic. Uh, some people say that social distancing, all what it do, does is flattens the growth. The growth is still going to happen, but it's going to happen slower, and so the crisis is not going to inundate health systems and etc. Others think the opposite or think differently. They think that social distancing uh, postpones the problem to until there is a better treatment, more efficient treatment, and the ability to treat uh, the sick 
and there's not going to be so much propagation, uh, which is probably what, what I would say. Uh, so what do they say? That with, with no intervention of the government, uh, infection will go exponentially, and that's not totally true. Infections will grow exponentially uh, until there is a level of contamination that there is already a limitation of how many people can be contamin contaminated. Or the disease is of the nature that don't contaminate so much. Ebola has, is a horrible disease, much uh, more lethal than uh, corona, but Ebola is so, lit uh, so lethal that is actually not so, uh, it doesn't propagate so fast. And so the World Health Organization and countries managed to control Ebola to a certain degree, although now we have another big surge of Ebola in Africa. Um, second thing, yes, very careful, very expensive, extensive social distance work. Now, we don't know what's going to happen in between. What do we mean in between is the kind of thing we are doing here, whereby we are doing a opening while still in certain parts of the US there is substantial increase in number of cases of the pandemic. Uh, the other thing that's happening in the US, tying to what I said earlier, is that the summer is coming. And in the southern states is warm. So I think the transmission will be slower in this period, and many scholars are predicting a second wave in the fall. Now, at the same time, some people think that there will be vaccines uh, either by the end of the year or by the fall, but with still low levels of production. I don't know. Uh, and actually, these slides here talk about uh, the con social distance, uh, distancing, this is a slide in the left, uh, social distancing, uh, basically increase doubling, uh, doubling the duplication time of number of cases. What does that mean? Is that the disease is contaminating slower because of social distance. And same thing in the world, uh, in the countries that are doing social distance and managing. Um, and new cases in the world have basically flattened because the 20 largest developed notion, nations had created major social distance. Uh, now, what's happening, and uh, like you saw, uh, when we Harubi and, uh, and Kelly showing their research, we doing research on the area, is there is a large number of fields trying to deal with or help with the pandemic in some dimension of, or the other. A lot of the emphasis of pandemic dealing and research has been on the disease itself. Uh, and they are looking at ways of recontamination, uh, methods of transmission, um, treatment, of course, of the disease, vaccine of the disease, and uh, what I find a very healthy effect, a lot of clinical research. And uh, basically the CDC and uh, some of the other regulatory entities of the states creating a much more nimble approach. Uh, and a lot of clinical trials going on. And uh, what I would say is the thing that I say in this course regularly before pandemic is that the laws for Uber, law for taxi, yellow taxi in New York, don't work very well for Uber. The laws for Airbnb don't work very well for hotels and vice versa. So these methods that we have of creating vaccines and testing vaccines and etc. are not really the methods that a digital society with an incredible amount of 
private information and shared information can deal. So I actually find the CDC, and sorry about saying this, and many of the US entities dealing with the virus really primitive in their technologies. Uh, the US medical system, which I we are going to talk a little bit more later, um, actually is very behind in use of electronic medium. When Obama was creating the Obamacare, which really was very difficult because of all the resistance from all the economic power, you have to understand the health part in the United States is 19% of the economy. So it's huge amounts of money invested, invested, and economic interest on it. And there is no other country that has so many layers in healthcare. Uh, to be even a little bit more critical, the U.S. spends more per capita in health than any other country, and the second one is Switzerland, spends two-thirds per capita than what we have spent. And in the ranking of quality, of average quality of healthcare in the United States, is number 33 in the world. We spend more than anyone else by one-third and our quality of care is weak compared with the socialized medicine countries like UK, Canada, etc., France, etc., etc., etc. So that says something about care. Now, a lot of the development of new medications and development of new treatments come from the U.S. and maybe are financed by the U.S. public. And maybe some of the other countries are just kind of benefiting from it, it without spending the money on it. I don't know, but I actually think that uh, our methods of implementing healthcare are very inefficient. You think about there is uh, there are doctors, there are health insurance companies, there are medication distribution uh, uh, companies. There is the government supporting it. Uh, partially or fully. The states work in very different ways. All of these and the hospitals uh, are involved in this. So there are all these layers of healthcare, very inefficient, very, very inefficient. And, uh, you know, President Trump uh, criticizes intensively Obamacare, but the alternatives doesn't seem very clear that there is one that they that he is proposing. So that's one thing that might be the result of this pandemic. Maybe we are going to rethink uh, a little bit how we do medicine. Uh, for example, one thing Obama did positively is uh, he actually invested some money in electronizing of medical records. And although that's still very spotty and still very disorganized, there has been uh, several billion dollars invested. And like, for example, in New York now, all doctors are, suppo are supposed to not fill up a prescription by paper, but send it electronically to the pharmacy or the pharmacy entity. And there has been a vertical integration of pharma pharmaceutical provisioning uh, with healthcare insurance companies, and maybe that's creating some rational. Interestingly enough, uh, companies like Google are actually creating their own methods of medical care because they are seeing, uh, they are seeing tremendous amount of money potentially uh, and better diagnostics, diagnostics using machine learning, uh, like we talked last time and et cetera. So maybe there is a change coming, coming on. Okay, um, and this is actually three graphs talking about um, about the extensive amount of research uh, participated. And you know, we we already just recently had a little snafu on this, whereby uh, first the conclusions published in Lancet were that malaria drug is not good for COVID. Now that paper has been called back because not that uh, the drug is good, but the paper is unreliable. 
So you really haven't had a con conclusion. And so this happens always in science. Science advances. Some science is economically motivated and biased. And uh, time will prove what it is. Uh, there are many trials looking at this thing uh, and looking at health. And uh, eventually we'll know what, what the real to do. Now, uh, the rebalancing of work life. This is, all of you are feeling this. Um, for basically our class is distance. If our class wouldn't be distance, we would be sitting in your work, in a classroom, discussing face to face. And here we are distance. I don't see all of you. Um, I am trying to chop, chop, chop the course in little pieces, not to bore you too much with four hours of talking. We have all this, this rebalancing. So what does they say? For those fortunate enough to be working these days, because a large percentage of the US population is unemployed at this moment, although there is a back to work benefit Although there is a back-to-work benefit, uh, like two, uh, two million people are, are now back into employment, which still there are many million unemployed, um, everyone changed their daily routines. Technology investors recall that, uh, li listen to this, technology investors recall the legend of Instagram securing 100 million monthly active users in two years. Great growth. And Fortnite uh, snagging Fortnite sna snagging of uh, 100 million uh, MAUs in 18 months. But never business focus applies like Zoom. Going from 10 million to 200 million meeting participants in three months, meaning this is obviously a major change in behavior. Uh, and so talking about remote work, it's still early and the novelty might wear off. Actually, uh, there is a lot of pushback if you look in the social media, but in general, so far so good. At the margin, according to Mary Meeker, productivity is the same or higher. I don't know. I, I have to tell you about my personal experience. Um, I am 100 miles from New York in Long Island uh, with part of my family here. I've been here for three months. And I never have been so backlogged in my work as I am today. So I, I actually don't know if the productivity is higher or not. I think it's, it's aggressive to say the productivity is higher. I think what you say that in certain professions and certain persons work better remotely. And there are certain careers and certain things that you do better face to face, or at least with current technology, you do better face to face. And the other thing is we don't know if the novelty is not going to wear off and then and then we are going to go back a little bit to the old thing. The one thing I'm I am pretty sure um I don't know if I have walked in New York City uh 6 months ago uh in one of the main thoroughfares. A lot of stores for rent. Like I counted between 15 and 20 percent of the stores on Lexington Avenue, between 75th and 65th, were out to rent, all with temporary store, temporary tenancy. Why? Because a lot of people are buying electronically, uh, or they go to a store, see a shirt, and then they buy it to Amazon or to Walmart, much cheaper. Um, so actually, retail has been already in pressure. Now, what I expect is that in New York, uh, commercial space is going to have the same eff effect. Very serious effect in commercial space. 
because companies are going to discover that part of their workforces can work from home and they can save. Actually, you guys are going to, to CPA firms. That already has happened to a certain degree in CPA firm. Many firms do this thing they call hoteling. And what is hoteling? Is basically they, the office, not everyone has an office. Most people just have temporary offices. You go, you go to your uh, office, you have a file cabinet on wheels, and you take it, you rent a space, borrow a space for that day. Because most of the time you'll be spending your time at the client. Now, interesting question here to imagine is maybe not hoteling, maybe doing it from home. Uh, and not in the client. Remember, remember we talked about distance remote auditing? Well, it will be remote auditing and not hoteling. Hmm. Interesting. So I don't know. Uh, I think the productivity is going to be a multidimensional analytic here, depending on geography, depending on the business, depending on what they are doing, depending on the client, if you're talking about auditing. Uh, some clients will totally require uh, the auditor to be there face-to-face, -face, and some of the billing models will be by hour, as continue to be by hour, and if you don't show up in the client, you don't get paid. But I think that's going to change substantially. Uh, third thing, and this is all speculation, and I think one of my PhD students, one of these days, will do a dissertation looking at these efficiencies. And I'm sure that the ICPA will be very interesting. Okay, video calls were not overused, are efficient, productive, and they tend to start and end on time. Actually, that's, that has been my experience. Uh, typically, we in the U.S. are reasonably efficient about doing things on time. When I do a lot of projects with Brazil, and they are always five, ten minutes late. In the U.S., typically, they are on time. They finish on time or finish early. Um, and we are learning, you know, working my PhD student, working with Abby, with Kelly, and etc. We are learning to be efficient. Um, but I don't think that our space time it, uh, changed very much. Actually, I think I see my PhD students one-to-one -one basis more now than I, I did. at When I go to Rutgers, it's like a zoo. And now I can schedule and talk to the PhD. Abby, what do you think? Yeah. My personal experience is that um, remote work uh, makes me more productive. And also, uh, I can call you whenever like, I have time and you also have time. And uh, uh, actually, I feel I talk to you more often than uh, physically uh, like meet you like in person. So. I, I think so, too. I, I think that we talk more often. Although with you, I was even before, we talked quite a lot. And you and Avion and Kelly, uh, and when we, when we was doing this project with uh, the mayor, mayor's office of Rio de Janeiro on, um, on uh, basically looking at expenditures on hospitals in Rio de Janeiro, six large hospitals, is a huge project. And uh, uh, they speak Portuguese, she only speaks English. So I have to be on those calls too. But uh, those would be distance anyway. So it's very interesting how for this thing. Um, I don't know. Message and video based information sharing, editing is effective. We were using this before. Um, now, this is something that we don't understand. People outside of headquarters feel more included. This is for corporations. I actually asked this to my son and my daughter in law, uh, and they didn't say yes or no. Um, um, okay, now this is this is true. It's much easier to bring outside that for quick video discussions, and you it's easier to get access to senior management of the companies we deal. They usually give you half an hour to talk distance because it's efficient. Um, now, interesting this thing of commute time elimination. Yes, you don't commute. Um, Time is more flexible. 
but you know new rules for the household uh, have to happen and like for example i never really pay too much attention on lunch time and dinner time i just work to it now i'm a little bit more careful because the family is here so i don't know maybe it's just my personal things um now this is actually worthwhile talking a little bit about and i only have a few more minutes so uh, uh so it's interesting so pre-existing management bottleneck around individual performance organization design are only amplified in a distributed environment biggest productivity and balance challenge come from parents with preschool aged children this is actually i think the major problem these days if you still have a job your kids are still at home and uh, they don't go the school serves as a babysitter you don't have that babysitter and that's something that society is going to have to come up with rules but i think probably children are going to go back to school reasonably soon but there'll be a residual of they are used to some classes distance so maybe there'll be a, a part of this um, so creating the office online can be successful including regular scheduled meetings okay companies that focus on effective written communication documentation uh, dub the amazon way where plans are shared in little form for editing either synchronous or synchronous have had an easier time shifted to distributed work i think i'll leave the organizational guys study this i have no idea what's really a thing now this is very interesting this is about on demand uh on demand work and what is on demand work uh, on demand work is work not with big contracts and etc is uh, marketplaces like online marketplaces transportation like uber marketplaces uh airbnb uh food delivery uh health and beauty etc and you know each one of these industries had a very different effect um online marketplaces obviously people are doing much more uh buying online okay having a job or not having a job etc transport transportation has a major major dip uh, people, for example, in New York, don't want to go on the subway. And, uh, and uh, while they are not working, they don't have to. But when some have, because they're essential workers, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, housing, phenomenal in the New York area. Uh, there is a migration out of New York City. Uh, there is a high demand for real estate in surrounding areas. New Jersey a little bit less because New Jersey have been hit very hard, um, very hard by the pandemic. Um, and so, if you have a look at look at, for example, this charts below, um, you can start seeing uh, these things like Etsy, Airbnb, Uber, and they have been growing really extensively and now recently a major collapse um i don't know what's going to happen difficult to difficult to think about that i think the hotel the uh, the hotel industry is going to there'll be a long time before people go to hotels as comfortably as they used to go uh, i think People are going to try to avoid, if they can afford it, avoid public transportation to a certain degree. So things like electric mopeds and bicycles and et cetera, individual transportation uh, are going to increase. I think the research uh, uh, on self-driving cars is going to accelerate because people will want their own transportation if they can and people are going to move towards the suburbs more and so if you look at the chart all the way in the right um talk about on 
on-demand work is what we call the gig economy. Um, it's going to change a little bit what the gigs are going to be. However, I think regulations of the government, for example, there has been a big conflict about what is the character, what is the nature of Uber workers? Okay, are they employees, they are not employees, et cetera, et cetera. And many cities like California, very social oriented, or some people call it socialistic kind of uh, governments, basically forced Uber to treat them as employees. I don't know what's going to be happening with that. But I think it's worthwhile thinking about on-demand. You know, I wouldn't be surprised several of you will opt to have more intense family lives and work on a on-demand higher wage per minute, but less employment. So I don't know. I think this is a, a culture thing. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty, but we know some things. There is a change on the way of people are working. A lot of jobs have been lost. Financial insecurity has increased substantially. We don't know how the world will look like in three months or 24 months. This is actually Mary Mikhail. I actually think the changes are going to be substantive, but they are not going to be a total different world. Um, and the nature of work job evolved rapidly. And on-demand work, gig economy will be big. Uh, relevance of teach-enabled multi-way communication. So basically, uh, the Zooms of the world are going to expand. And then to finish my last slide for today, I actually have more, more slides, but I'm running out of time. Um, what if COVID-19 serves as a common enemy that unites and serves as a forcing function to modernize and improve government, healthcare, education. Okay, let's just talk about education for a second. Um, universities are with people getting more used to distance education are not going to be as geographically contingent. Okay, Rutgers is not going to be necessarily the New Jersey University. I think that the choice of paths will be more de derived if you are distance. The choice of paths will be more on narrow domain competence. What's the best school on professional accounting? What's the best school on analytic methods? And less in where it is so I can commute there, etc. Although face-to-face -face education is a luxury and sometimes a worthwhile luxury. Um, improve coordination between government and business. I actually think that will happen in a pressure mode already happening with this manifestation. Um, and this is something that we already observe, help people find jobs and training as suited. Actually, I have been talking about this now for about a year at Rutgers of creating curricula that uh, adapts to the modern lifestyle. Um, and then the other things promote more considered consumption, uh, stay, uh, get back to base, including staying closer to home, and family connectedness. Community, faith. So these are kind of the wishful thinking, the kind of changeful, changeful things that COVID might uh finish i'm going to ask uh we have about three minutes or four minutes i'm going to ask you a couple of questions to take um i call it unintended consequences but it's not exactly because covid is not uh, intended activity but i i want to ask a couple of you what do you think that will change in your lives after covid matt you want to give it a shot Oh, open your microphone. I can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear that, him, Abby? 
No, I cannot. Okay, so, uh, so keep fiddling with it, Matt. See if you reach it. Macintosh, what do you think is going to happen? That's sure. a change uh, in your life. So sure. there, there's a there's a lot of things to expect. Um, Amongst them is uh, the way we work. So that businesses will, will change or move heavily to digital. And then there will be more remote learning from what we see happening. Uh, there will be a, uh, an increase in the use of the internet. We're still going to uh, uh, have social distancing because uh, speculation that uh, if this this disease might add up or uh, reoccur in a heavy way, or there could be an emergence of a new one. And then uh, the the economic impact also there will be uh, a lot of a lot of cost efficiency. People won't have to use vehicles. You know, there's going to be a lot of saving on uh, gasoline and uh, repairs on vehicles, and then. Um, uh, we like child care, you know, families at home, and they can look after their children while they work, so they're going to be saving on child care as well. And offices okay. are also going okay. to save on rent. They're very good, Macintosh. Uh, let me just get a couple more opinion. Michael Totora, what do you think? Well, um, I, I agree with Macintosh. I think a lot of it's everything's going to be remote learning, uh, education you know like you said records won't just be a geological you know state of new jersey people from all over will apply but um i don't know i was near the jersey shore this weekend and everyone's at the beach it was totally crowded so i don't think i think people are going to go back to normal after this for the most part i mean businesses will change like with curbside pickup and delivery and uh like remote learning or live broadcast if you're going to like a, a church or something like that but people are set in their ways I, i'm not sure i'm skeptical if there's going to be change to be honest i have some degree of skepticism. tuma what do you think open your microphone okay all right can you hear me yes all right i think um well in regards to like humanity some people can be like traumatized after this to be honest um just i know personal experience it's really hard for me to get close to my like not close in regards to like relationship but just close in like human touch with like friends or even strangers it's just i don't know um just like a thought in the back of my head as to like okay how do i approach them you know, I think that would just kind of stay for a little bit until, I don't know, maybe there's a vaccine possibly, but it's just my thought of it. Yeah, I, I read the interesting thing, I think what some magazine about we are back to seven aids on the internet instead of personal contact in dating, you get them, uh, like Romeo and Juliet, seven aiding each other and et cetera. Very interesting. That that's one angle we didn't talk at all. Well, how will this affect personal relationships? Meaning, I I actually personally, my son is around here with us, so it's very close, and I never expected in a grown age to spend three months with him. Great. My daughter is with her husband in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I was with their kids all the time, and I really miss them. And she she is a very successful movie maker, uh, but um, I don't see them. So I mean, I talk to them every day on FaceTime, but uh, it's a uh, personal relationship has changed a lot. Okay, so I think I have to stop. Can I just read you something to finish? It will be one minute over time. Um, I, talked, I taught a class just before this started, already was kind of, um social distancing i was going to go to brazil and teach an ai class and i didn't go and i asked them what were the unintended consequences of and this is before brazil got so bad and i have a list of 10 things that they told me first virtual education a lot of change on the nature of education second increase in remote work we all agree what that third one decrease in personal privacy. 
much more penetration on, on individual space. Fourth, rem increase in remote shopping. Now, techie one, we think on automatic trading algorithms. Basically, the, uh, the automatic trading that was based on machine learning and history doesn't work today because the markets change a lot. It's interesting. Um, one other we talked about, more remote socializing. Um, and then I had a couple of ladies in the class and she said, oh, I have to do much more housekeeping because my nanny cannot come here. Uh, and, uh, and then something about legislation, uh, flexible. Oh, one more comment about increase in birth rate because you stay home with your, with your partner. Actually, some other people predicted, uh, Xin Xin and Wen Wu predicted exactly the opposite, decrease in, in, in birth rates because some literature says that that happened. Um, and then the final that I thought was just finished with a little bit of humor is a couple of the mothers and fathers say, now the kids stay home and they take school electronically and we have to help them. So we have to learn what they are learning and we have to know it to help them. And that's very difficult. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny. You're taking fourth grade mathematics and you don't know it. So you have to learn it with them so you don't look silly. So I thought that was kind of funny. So guys, I have a homework for you, very short homework, but I want you to do. I want you to do me a half a page to a page of what you think COVID is going to happen in the future with the environment, with the economy, uh, with your personal life, just a few bullets to make you think about this on a personalized manner. And before next Monday, send it to Abby and to me. Okay, so it's one page, it's not a big homework, it's a short homework, but forcing you to think. And then I'm going to pick a few of them and I'm going to discuss eventually in this course. Okay? Thank you for bearing with me in this four hours and uh, more than all, thank my visiting speakers for this great job that they did, even if they are all studying for the PhD exam. Take care, guys. Hey, uh, this is Jack. Um, I had a quick question yeah. for you. Um, yes, please. Can you explain the assignment again? Half a page to a page of what? I, I can't hear you. Say that again. I'm sorry. I think um, this is Jack, and I was asking you um, if you could explain the assignment again. You said half a page to one page explaining what? What do you think that's going to be the effect of COVID on the economy, on you, on your personal relationships, on education? What do you think they are the, the consequences of this downturn or this closing out of the economy for three months? 